This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. I'm very pleased to welcome you all here on tonight on behalf of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre to our presentation with the Honourable Julia Gillard AC as she discusses her book, Not Now, Not Ever. Firstly, I would like to invite Rosemary Ranganine to provide the Ghana welcome. Rosemary is a Ghana elder and an award-winning proud South Australian Aboriginal woman who is sole operator and owner of the Healing Centre for Griefology since 1993. Please join me in welcoming Rosemary. Nachala, thank you, Joe, for that introduction. And Nachala to the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre for inviting me to perform Welcome to Ghana Country. And I would like to acknowledge the distinguished guests Jacinta Thompson and the Bob Hawke Centre, and of course, the Honourable Julia Gillard. It's always an honour and a privilege to perform Welcome to Ghana Country, because it gives me an opportunity to welcome non-Aboriginal people onto Ghana Country. And with a special welcome to any Aboriginal persons present here today, who are of Ghana heritage, similarly to other Aboriginal people from, from across the lands. It's also an honour and a privilege to perform Welcome to Country, as it enables me to keep my culture alive, so as to acknowledge my Ghana ancestry and ancestors on my dad's side. And on my mum's side, Gugatha and Wirugu from the west coast of South Australia. So when performing Ghana Welcomes, I love to bring an educational component and for it to be interactive. For example, let me first explain the meaning of the Ghana words and then I'll formally welcome you. And because you are a group of people, I'll be doing a group Ghana welcome. I'll ask you, Namani, which sounds a bit like no money, right? <laughs> and Namani, I'm simply asking you all, are you all well? And you'll respond with Mani Ardlu. And to help you recall Mani Ardlu, I have a few images for you to imagine. So imagine money, but it's Mani. A piece of steel is not soft, it's ard. <laughs> and of course, the last one, Lou, just imagine a toilet. As a loo. So when you say Marnie, I'll be back to me, you're simply saying to me, we are all well. So I'm about to formally ask you Namani, and I'll invite you to remember those three images. On behalf of myself and my Ghana ancestors, Namani. Oh, oh fantastic. So continuing with the educational component for the city centre of Adelaide, Tandanya is the Ghana word for place of the red kangaroo. And traditional Ghana culture, as with all traditional cultures, Aboriginal cultures across the continent, was highly intelligent and can claim to be a complete civilization. And, sim and civilization simply means an advanced state of human society in which a high level of art, science, religion, and government has been reached. So for over 60,000 years, our ancestors maintained a complete civilization and not a book in sight. And many more aren't aware that Ghana country is far and wide. So if you imagine a wheel with nine spokes and the city of Adelaide is the hub, and these spokes approximately extend into the following places, Crystal Brook, which is about two hours north of Adelaide. Then back down in a southeasterly direction into Clare, about one and a half hours from Adelaide. Still in a southerly direction into Gawler. Follow the foothills of the Mount Lofty Ranges and continuing in a southerly direction to the south coast, 
the Fluro Peninsula into Cape Jervis, about one and a half hours from Adelaide. And to complete the circle, we'll turn around and head north up the Gulf of St Vincent, bypass Adelaide, Port Wakefield, Port Broughton, and back into Crystal Brook. Furthermore, many aren't aware that the Mount Lofty Ranges, the top of the Mount Lofty Ranges, is the country of the Purimunk people. My welcome always acknowledges my gratitude for the sharing of modern Australia. And from my heart to yours, I'm truly welcoming, welcoming you, each and every one of you. However, I also acknowledge my deepest sadness for the human cost to us as Aboriginal people for this sharing. And that our Aboriginal ancestors never ceded sovereignty to our traditional lands, seas and waterways and their complete civilization. But realising I, and I hope it'll always be we have a right, a role and a responsibility to be a part of the reconciliation. This is reconciliation in practice, us being here tonight. Because our nation of Australians have many cultural identities, let's continue recognising each other's humanity so that we can continue moving forward as one nation to a place of equity, justice and in partnership together as a contemporary, as contemporary Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians for the health and well-being of our future generations under our great Southern Cross. So as we journey through our Australian lives, walking upon Ghana country, our Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal ancestors ask us to tread ever so gently, as with our youth, who are our future. They too ask us to tread ever so gently, and not just upon Ghana country, but tread even more gently upon Mother Earth. Because this is her home, and all living creatures are just visitors passing through. Yes, that includes us as humans. So thank you again, Joanne, and the Bob Hawke Centre. And like everyone else, I'm very much looking forward to the conversation between Julia and Julia. Thank you. We are very pleased to see so many of you here this evening, and I would especially like to welcome our speaker, of course, the Honourable Julia Gillard, AC, journalist Julia Lester, Ms Jane Stinson, member for BADCO, and University of South Australia Council members. I would also like to thank Jacinta Thompson, Executive Director and Events and Exhibitions Producer of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre and her team for their work in presenting tonight's event. Julia Gillard was the 27th Prime Minister of Australia and the first and only woman to serve in this role. Since leaving office, she has dedicated her time to advocacy, governance roles and writing. In 2021, Julia was appointed chair of Welcome, a global charitable foundation based in the UK that supports science to solve urgent worldwide health challenges. Julia is also the founder and inaugural chair of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership at King's College London and chair of its sister institute at the Australian National University. In 2014, Julia joined the board of Beyond Blue, one of Australia's foremost mental health awareness bodies, and has served as its chair since 2017. As a lifelong advocate for increasing access to education, especially in developing nations, Julia was chair of the Global Partnership for Education from 2014 to 2021. On the 9th of October in 2012, Prime Minister Julia Gillard stood up and proceeded to make all present in Parliament House that day pay attention. We're now 10 years on from the speech that stopped us all in our tracks, Julia Gillard's misogyny speech. Tonight, Julia Gillard will discuss her latest book, Not Now, Not Ever, with journalist Julia Lester. Please join me in welcoming the Honourable Julia Gillard and Julia Lester. Well, good evening. What a great sight it is, Julia Gillard, looking Amazing. at this expectant crowd. <laughs> a very large crowd. A very large crowd. And we do have also a large crowd, of course, online. 
I want to firstly say this is the book. <laughs> and guess what colour it is? <laughs> For those of you who can't see, it's bright pink. Whose idea was the bright pink? I think a few people are taking credit, but it really goes to Connie in my office who came up with the pink. Uh, it's kind of an ironic statement uh, and also definitely makes it stand out in bookshops. So there is a, <laughs> there's method behind our colour selection. And uh, the book is a fundraiser to support the Global Institute for Women's Leadership. So we're very keen to get as many copies as possible out there. Julia Gillard and the rest of us, I'd like to take us back to the day. So let's just imagine for a moment, it's the 9th of October 2012, 10 years ago, almost to the day. We're in Parliament House, the House of Representatives. Julia Gillard is Prime Minister. Tony Abbott is Leader of the Opposition. They face each other each sitting day. And you've probably watched Parliament. It's actually very close yeah. that you two stand across the desk and the dispatch boxes. In a place in Question Time, which is where this is happening, which is often called the bear pit of Australian Parliament, it's noisy, it's argumentative, and there is a bit of ugliness in the air because Peter Slipper has been the Speaker of the House since the previous year, chosen by Julia Gillard and her party. By choosing him, a member of the other side, the Conservative side, she and her party and supporters can just maintain numbers in the House. But it's tight. It's very tight. Peter Slipper is by now involved in two scandals, and he stepped aside. I want to talk about the second just very briefly. He's been accused of sexual harassment. He sent some very unsavoury text messages. Gross, really containing references to female genitalia, among other things. Tony Abbott has proposed a motion demanding Mr Slipper's resignation. Now, this gets a little bit confusing, doesn't it? Who's demanding what from whom? He knows, because this is what you do in question time, it's a very strategic time, isn't it? He knows that if Slipper goes, so possibly does Julia Gillard's tenuous hold on power, because Labor is running a minority government. Mr Abbott's absolutely getting stuck into the Prime Minister. She should sack him, he says. And he says, what female Labor members would describe as sexist and misogynist is being supported by Ms Gillard. This is a government, he says, referring to Julia Gillard's government, which is only too ready to detect sexism, to detect misogyny, no less, until they find it in one of their own supporters. Just an ordinary day in Parliament, Julia. Really, <laughs> well, in many ways, it was just an ordinary day in Parliament. And, I mean, Tony Abbott's uh, style as opposition leader was to be always combative and to be always trying to create the impression that the minority government was teetering on a precipice and was about to fall. Um, actually, all of that was inflated and inflated on this day. I mean, whatever happened with uh, Peter Slick the government was secure. We had arrangements with others, which meant the government had a majority on the House of Representatives. So that was actually never in contest. Uh, but Tony Abbott's style was to be punchy in question time. And then he would frequently, after asking five or six or seven questions, uh, move a motion. And that was just his routine. It hadn't been a routine adopted by oppositions in the past. They'd saved the moving of motions to the days that there was something incredibly serious going on. And so when the opposition moved such a motion, it really heralded that this was a big and different day. But Tony Abbott basically did it every day. So I was readying myself for that, for question time, which would probably be followed by a motion at some point. Um, 
And, you know, I knew that the uh, theme of the day was sexism because uh, Peter Slipper had been unmasked as having sent these text messages. This was new information. So it was obviously running strongly in the news cycle. Uh, so I knew sexism would be the theme of the day. I knew that Peter Slipper would be considering his position that day. And so I got ready to be asked a series of questions by Tony Abbott. And then if he moved one of his inevitable motions, then my uh, routine with those was to not involve myself in them, to let someone else from the government do it because I didn't want to be seen to be elevating his tactics. So I got ready for question time, knowing it was going to be about sexism. I'd have to say I was literally gagging on the hypocrisy uh, that an opposition that had profited so much from sexist stereotyping of me was apparently now going to feign some sort of concern about sexism. I mean, gagging on the hypocrisy and very frustrated that for a long period of time, I'd sort of uh, not uh, engaged in this debate. I'd sort of stayed silent, stayed stoic when all of this sexist imagery was around me. So, you know, I was kind of frustrated, coolly angry about it all. But my preparation for question time was basically asking my staff to get together Tony Abbott's top 10 sexist quotes, which they did remarkably quickly. <laughs> uh, and uh, they gave them to me. And so I walked into the House of Representatives going, well, he'll ask me a question. I'll flourish one of these quotes. He'll ask me a question. I'll flourish another. And uh, that'll be the way the day goes. But what actually happened was, instead of asking any questions, so this was a break from his routine, quite a sharp break, he leapt to his feet and moved a motion. And I walked over to the advisor's box once he'd done that, and because I was already feeling this cool anger, I did say to the advisors, oh, I'm going to take the reply. And I, my chief of staff reminded me in preparing this book uh, that he said to me at that stage, you know, really, are you going to do that? Because it had been my routine to not get involved in opposition tactics like this. And I did stop and I did think about it. So in an alternate reality, I might have agreed not to take the motion, in which case the misogyny speech would never have been delivered. Uh, but I did end up saying, no, I'm definitely going to take the reply because, quote unquote, as Ben recalls, I'm sick of this shit. Um, <laughs> so the misogyny speech is really that. <laughs> you say, by the way, Julia, that you're not someone who usually swears, even in your mind. Uh, no, I don't. Oh, you weren't being honest uh, about that. Uh, I, I, did, uh, I did say in my story, I'm not someone who usually thinks in swear words. And oh, I think, all right. I think, that's, I think that's broadly true. Uh, but I'm uh, I certainly not. I did have the terminology, um, you know, for goodness sake, um, going through my mind um, that, that morning, cleaning it up just in case any children are watching. Um, and, uh, but I'm not someone who routinely has a saying like that running on loop through their mind, but it was on loop through my mind that morning. There's a quite lovely description. I don't know that it was in the book, but I read it elsewhere from one of your staffers. It wasn't in the room to start with, writing a boring speech about something else, but watching you and he didn't realise that you were going to respond. And then he saw you stand up and he thought, oh, I better turn this up, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and then he saw the finger go up. Then he saw Tony Abbott looking a bit, mm, <laughs> looking at his watch, getting a little bit uncomfortable. So there you were. You said, OK, I'll do it. The staff are saying, you sure? You're armed with 10 quotes. And then you say, I rise to oppose the motion. I will not be lectured about sexism and misogyny by this man. I will not. The government will not be lectured about sexism and misogyny by this man. Not now, not ever. Did you make that up as you went along? So the not now, not ever just... <laughs> wow! <laughs> uh. Yeah, that's... I just, uh, while he was talking, I did some handwritten dot points to sort of guide me, you know, help guide my thinking uh, through a structure of a speech. So I was doing that as I was listening to him with one ear, um, and, and which was enough. Um, <laughs> 
And we actually produce the handwritten notes in the book Very and I've got the world's worst handwriting. So uh, spot the legible letter could become a game for you all to play at home. Uh, and I just gave it off that. So the terminology in it, none of it was, you know, work through or anything like that. It was just coming to me. And in fact, uh, when you watch the start of it, uh, you see me use the line about he needs a mirror. And actually, that's been shouted out over my shoulder by some members of the back bench who was like, he needs a mirror. I'm like, that's a great line. He needs a mirror. <laughs> uh, so it was all happening in real time. <laughs> We have to remember that you were, you've been at this for years by this stage, at Parliament, background in law, debating at school. You're very good on your feet. You like, a, you like it, don't you, out there on the front line? Yes. I mean, I have said to people, in one way, the misogyny speech was the work of a moment because I just stood up and gave it. In another way, it was the work of well more than the decade I'd been in Parliament. I mean, I could not have given that speech in my first or second year in Parliament. You obviously get better and better and better at your craft. You get more and more exposed to the front line of question time. You get more used to dealing with it when it's got really hot. Um, and so by the time I was Prime Minister, I had that you know, skill set with me and I could bring it to bear in that speech. And one of the things I had set out to do when I went into Parliament was to show that a woman could thrive in that adversarial environment that you could give as good as you got. And I always steered towards the kind of punchy debating in the Parliament. So when we were in opposition, I was manager of opposition business, so the chief tactician, uh, chief organiser of question time for the opposition and I honed the skills even more then and I took that with me into government. Julia Gillard, one of the strengths, one of the great strengths of this speech was your opening and that was a stunner. And then you went on to do a line almost Shakespearean of <laughs> repeating, I was very offended. I was very personally offended. I was very offended on behalf of the women of Australia. Things like the quote of what the housewives of Australia need to understand as they do the ironing. One of Tony Abbott's comments about the carbon pricing. I was offended, you said, by the sexism, the misogyny of the leader of the opposition. I was offended. Is that an old debating style? <laughs> or did that just come up on the day again? I've re uh I really don't know. I'm, I'm not sure that it's an old debating style, although I guess organising your um, mind in points and themes and a bit of repetition is something that you do in debates. But really, if you'd asked me when I sat down, uh, repeat for me the first few sentences of the speech, I wouldn't have been able to. I mean, it was you know, definitely given in the flow. And so I wasn't conscious in the flow of you know, definitely repeating for emphasis or anything like that. I was just delivering it. And I think it was coming from this, you know, sense of cool anger, this sense of frustration. I think that was fueling uh, the speech and that's what you see on display. And I think that's one of the reasons that it has resonated so broadly is Many people, many women certainly know what it's like to have, you know, gone home frustrated with a sexist moment, with a gendered barrier, with something that's happened to you and not had an outlet for it, not had the ability in the moment to come up with the rejoinder or perhaps not had the power in the moment to deliver the rejoinder. And I think watching the speech gives people that sense of, well, you know, it, it can be done and helps them relieve their frustration of the gender unequal world we unfortunately still share. I'd like to come back to the whole issue of saying rather than not saying, because that's an undergirding theme. May I just remind us how you ended the speech? The leader of the opposition should think seriously about the role of women in public life and in Australian society, because we are entitled to a better standard than this. Not bad on the run, mate. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so straight after, what did you do when the speech was over? 
So I sat down, you know, the prime ministerial chair is at the table, the leader of the opposition's just across the table. You've got your front bench behind you. He has his front bench behind him and then the back bench seats are behind that. And I knew because he'd moved a motion to which a number of speakers would be entitled to speak that there would be further debate. So there'd be an opposition speaker, a government speaker, an opposition speaker, a government speaker. Uh, and I really had to sit in the chamber for the rest of that debate and then there would be a vote at the end of it. And so I sat there and I thought, oh, I'm going to have to sit here for quite a bit of time now. It's kind of like a real waste of time. Um, <laughs> I'm a very busy woman. I'm a busy woman. <laughs> uh, what can I do to make this a more productive moment? Uh, I know I will go and get the advisors to bring in some of the correspondence that needs signing and I can sit here at the table and I can do the correspondence. And so, you know, your chair like this one is one that you can swing all the way round. So I swung it round uh, to Wayne Swan, who was sitting behind me, and said, oh, I'm going to get the advisors to bring some correspondence in. And I'm going to interrupt here and say, Wayne Swan said, no, 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 <laughs> you can't do that after you've just given the Jacques speech. Now, you say he's not someone who often slips into French. I've Which never now, heard Wayne slip into French other than that moment. <laughs> never, ever. <laughs> but j'accuse is a very famous term for a really important speech, accusing people of really horrible racism, uh, prejudice, dreadful things. And then it must have begun to dawn, even as it was being delivered, you were delivering the speech, Twitter lit up, the blogosphere was shining. When? Did it sink in that you'd done something profound? Well, certainly not then. I mean, I knew it had landed with force as a speech in the parliament and I judged that off the reaction of the opposition because they went from being, you know, very animated, interjecting, heads up, thinking that they were on a winner to increasingly dropping their gaze, moving, you know, into silence, starting to look at their phones uh, to sort of avoid it. Uh, so I knew it had been uh, sort of had a speech with weight in that sense. When I turned to Wayne and he reacted so oddly, that was the first inkling I had that mm, there's something more going on here. And then Albo, current Prime Minister Albanese, I should say far more respectfully, um, <laughs> uh, Albo came up to me and sat for a moment and said, oh, I felt really sorry for Tony Abbott when he looked at his watch. <laughs> And, and this is, you know, um, you know, I like fighting Tories' album. I'm like, that's really odd, you know. Uh, and so there were these sort of straws in the wind that there was something more about this than uh, a powerful speech in the parliament. But it wasn't until, well, I guess the first thing was when I got back to my office and the office said that the, you know, telephones had lit up, that the emails were coming in, that there was a big wave of reaction out there. So that was sort of wave number one. And then, you know, within 24, 48 hours, it was quite clear that it was being reported, the speech around the world, quite differently to how it had been reported in Australia. Uh, but for me, in many ways, the sort of penny really, really dropped when not that long after the speech, I went to India as Prime Minister for an official visit. And an Indian policewoman turned to me and said, great speech. And it's, it was the difference between knowing it had had media pick up to knowing that, you know, people, women, real live people um, were actually noting it and thinking about it because I genuinely think you can get things that wash through the media that actually never, uh, never come down into the community and people don't really latch on to them. But that was the first real indication to me that women in particular were latching onto it and latching onto it in different parts of the world. If it's the only thing in 50 years' time for which you're remembered, that speech, <laughs> how is that for you? Oh, well, I'll be dead, so I won't be bothered. <laughs> um. <laughs> All right, 15 years. <laughs> 15 years. <laughs> uh, I'll definitely make that. Uh, 50 years, I'd be, yeah, 111, possibly not. Uh, I, look, 
I used to be, to be frank, I used to be a little bit frustrated uh, that, you know, I mean, it was in Parliament for decade and a half. I was Deputy Prime Minister. I was Prime Minister. We did a lot of big things. Um, and apparently it all came down to one speech. But I'm sort of reconciled with it now. And, you know, I mean, in many ways, uh, most people uh, don't exit a political career with much remembered at all. Uh, certainly, Australian politics is not sufficiently noted around the world that people know much about Australian politics. And so I do feel if, you know, there are people around the world and that's the only thing they know about Australian politics. I would prefer it was that than a whole lot of other things. Um, so I'm definitely at peace with that being, you know, uh, one of the opening lines of the obituary. <laughs> so what you did is actually stop not saying... And that is quite a theme of your book, because so many of us, as women, spend a great deal of our lives not saying. We don't want to be angry, we don't want to be pushy, we don't want to get the blokes cross, all the things. You named, you blamed, you pointed your finger loudly. You were in a very powerful position. It's still reverberating. Can we all do that? Can we point, name, blame? I wish I could just say a simple yes to that, but I don't think it's as easy as that. I think many women can and many men can call it out and should call it out and they're in a position that's secure enough, empowered enough that they can do that. And just interesting research sidebar, because this is what we do at the Global Institute for Women's Leadership, we research stuff. Uh, the research actually shows that if a man calls out sexism, uh, that will be better believed than if a woman calls it out, which in some ways is a kind of galling finding. Uh, but uh, people think that because they think if a man is calling out sexism, he's just doing it because he's doing it because he's concerned about it. Whereas if a woman's calling out sexism, maybe she's got a mixed motive because it's in her interests to say something is happening because it's sexist. So I think many men and women can call it out and should call it out. But I'm under no illusion that there are also plenty of times that it's impossible to. You know, the youngest person in the workplace, the most recently recruited, the most junior, uh, it's too much to say to that person, it's on your shoulders to call it out. But I think what you can suggest is that people try and find the allies at work, the people who think the same way, who might be able to support them or do it for them. Julia, you and I were just looking in the back room at a comment today. So this is 10 years later, when we hope things have got better. In Queensland's parliament, Anastasia Palisade, the Premier, says she will talk to Agriculture Minister Mark Furner after he referred to opposition MP Ross Bates. Ross Bates is a woman during Parliament yesterday, saying, what a dopey, stupid woman you are. What do you make of that? Well, I'm uh, surprised and disappointed because I have been saying uh, over the last week in many places where I've been talking about the misogyny speech that I do think it is increasingly difficult, indeed almost impossible, uh, for the same terminology that was used about me uh, to be used today without an enormous backlash. Uh, and you know, that is because I think we're much more sensitised now to sexist content, content and we're much more prepared to call it out. And certainly media, social media, are much more prepared to shine a light on it. So I haven't been following this, you know, scandal moment by moment, but I would imagine that's what's happening right now and so it should. I haven't been either. I have to say I was pretty surprised. Mm. So many things to say former Liberal Party Foreign Minister Julie Bishop, once described by Tony Abbott as a loyal girl, confirmed the existence of a kind of boys club in Parliament in Canberra, the Swinging Dicks. <laughs> really? Were they around when you were there? Oh, uh, I... <laughs> That's a very difficult question. Um, <laughs> 
I, I'm going to sound a bit partisan now, but I'm going to chance my arm on it anyway because I think it's the truth. Uh, I think we've got to be pretty careful when we say the parliament uh, because it's absolutely true to say that there's still more to do on all sides of politics to deal with sexism and misogyny. Everybody's got to get better. But the Labor Party did a very smart thing, and I was involved in the campaign for it. It was led by uh, Joan Kerner, the first woman to be Premier of the State of Victoria, and that was Labor adopted an affirmative action rule. And so if you go back and look at the statistics in the early 1990s in the federal parliament, you know, the Labor Party was like at 14%, 1-4% women, and I think the Conservatives were around about the same, maybe 13%, but basically even Stevens and really, really bad. Uh, Labor adopted the Affirmative Action uh, Program, and that has turbocharged the number of women representing Labor in the national parliament and in state parliaments. And so when you look round those parliaments now at the Labor team, you tend to see around half men, half women. You know, maybe 52, 48, maybe even 54, 46, but round about half, half. The conservative side of politics, in my view, made a major error in not adopting a similar target. They instead went for mentoring and networking style programs. And all these years later, they've sort of inched their way into the sort of 20 percent, but they haven't made the big lift. And you don't change dynamics until you change who's round the table. And so whilst the parliament, you know, question time, it's still raucous and uh, there are lots of things that still aren't equalised and people could look and say that is still a boys club. When you do the dig underneath into the party room meetings, into the ministries, into who's got political power uh, within each side of politics, you find a very different story on the Labor side compared with the Conservative side. And one of my hopes is that in this period of reflection that the Liberal and National parties would be going through after the election loss earlier this year, particularly an election loss which was so shaped around uh, high profile profile female independents taking their heartland seats, uh, that they will think this through and act differently for the future. I was watching you talk to former British Prime Minister Theresa May in one of your lectures in London, International Women's Day, yeah. and you were both comparing life as Prime Ministers, of course. Really what interested me was the only difference in your experiences was the name, you're prepared to say, I'm a feminist, um, we've got to get more women in, it's a boy's world, we've got to change it. She doesn't like doing that so much, she thinks she's playing into the bloke's hands, but essentially your experiences were very, very similar. Um, not in terms of the abuse that you caught, but in the gender imbalance in her party. Did that surprise you? Oh, no, it doesn't. I mean, I think uh, the... You know, I've, I've used the feminist word about myself all of my adult life, um, so I'm very comfortable with using it. I do think, though, that for many conservative women, uh, it came during their formative political experiences to be associated with uh, progressive politics with the left, and so it's not a term that they would comfortably apply to themselves. Now, I, in my own view, I think that's... Um, you know, misunderstanding how the term is used today when people talk about feminism, men talk about being feminists, and by it what they mean is that they're passionate about gender equality and they want to see change. Uh, but I can understand that people have got their own, you know, steps through politics and their own formative experiences, and she was reflecting that. Uh, but I think there's, you know, beyond the terminology, there is a sort of analytical difference, and I'm very clear about this analytical difference. I think we've been through the era of lean in, 
where a lot of the dialogue was about the way in which women needed to change. So, you know, the lean-in dialogue is all around um, if only women uh, stood up for themselves more, if only women showed more confidence, if only women negotiated for uh, their higher pay packets more assertively, um, if only women went for uh, the promotion even if they weren't sure whether they could do it. Basically, if only women acted a lot more like the stereotypes we associate with men, I think that is a misunderstanding of the way that power shapes sexist dynamics and what we've really got to do is change the structures. So, you know, affirmative action was a structural intervention. You can't do your pre-selections without pre-selecting a percentage of women. The structures changed. Whereas I think on the conservative side of politics, they've much more invested in the, if we invest in women's empowerment programs and women's confidence programs and women's networking programs, it'll make a big difference. And it'll make some difference, but it doesn't make the big difference that the structural changes make. And so I think Theresa and I, I'm, I'm very um, uh, respectful of her and between one thing and another, I see a bit of her in London. She's doing some amazing things still. She's very passionate about um, anti-slavery work to which she devotes a lot of her time. She's very passionate about combating domestic violence. So we'd be completely joined up on all of that. But I do think we've got a different analysis about what the change levers are. Let's look at the wonderful... <laughs> Let's look at the bright pink book then, shall we? I just want to briefly explain, Julie, what you've done is the speech, printed it, then your thoughts of the speech, other people's reflections on the speech, and then there is an interesting part for me, it was a great read, on misogyny past and present. Now, how can that be a great read? It just is. <laughs> and the third is fighting misogyny. So you might just move through a little bit of that. I was very taken in Catherine Murphy's comments, very prominent Australian journalist, you might know, she writes these days for The Guardian. And she was, on the day of the speech, she was locked in Parliament House, I imagine with headphones on, live blogging, which was a pretty new thing in those days, exactly what was happening. She was absolutely trained to write exactly what was happening, dispassionate exact, be accurate. And she says now, looking back almost to the point where she didn't understand what she was doing, mm. the words were right, but she said, I didn't really understand the power of the dynamics in Canberra was to actually knock at gender. So she said, at that stage, I'd been reporting for years. It took me that long to understand that I'd been buying the argument that you have to be dispassionate. Excuse me, dispassionate. And we've seen, as certainly in the last year, some very major journalists, Laura Tingle, Samantha Maiden, come out and say, this is what's happening and this is how I feel about it. That's a very new thing, isn't it? It, it is a very new thing and... The parallel in my mind is uh, from the time before, the book before Women and Leadership, which I co-authored with Ngozi Conjury wheeler where we examined all sorts of dimensions of women leaders. Uh, but we interviewed uh, women political leaders around the world and we had a fascinating conversation with Jacinda Ardern. And for me, that really cemented uh, a, a view that I hadn't, I, I sort of had seen little fragments of, but it hadn't come together as a complete thought. Uh, and it, it got it to, to land with me that it is very different when you've had more than one woman. So the early women, I think, you know, the first woman to be Prime Minister, the early women in the Canberra Press Gallery, the question you're really trying to answer is, can a woman do this? Because whilst people aren't running around articulating that question, it is definitely sitting in the back of their minds and they're looking at you and thinking to themselves, can she do this? And for women who are trying to answer that question, can she do this, the safest thing to do, uh, the most obvious thing to do is to try and do it like it's been done before and to show that you can master it and a woman can do it. And I think 
me in politics, other women who have been the first or other women who are early waves of change. That's what we've had to do. Someone like Jacinda Ardern, who is the third woman to lead New Zealand, you know, the question, can a woman do this, has been asked and answered. Jenny Shipley did, Helen Clark did for, you know, a decade or more. Uh, there'd be many New Zealanders that for, you know, most of their lifetime, they've uh, had a woman prime minister. That question is gone. Um, and so that you get to answer the next question, which is, can a, can a woman do this differently? Or does a woman want to do this differently? Or can the job be done differently by anyone? And I think what Catherine's pointing to in that chapter is her evolution and I think the evolution of a number of other women journalists who, when they were trying to prove themselves in this very Boise environment, just accepted they had to do it the way it had historically been done, pretending you were dispassionate, pretending that gender was no part of the dynamic. But now they are clearly um, press gallery leaders. No one is going to question, you know, can Laura Tingle report? Is Catherine Murphy up to writing opinion pieces? I mean, no one's going to do that. They've got more freedom to then, you know, conduct themselves in the different style, to be asking themselves the question, well, if I didn't, pretend I was dispassionate, if I was looking at this as a woman, if I was bringing the gender politics to the fore, how would I be writing this story? And they're giving themselves the freedom to do that. It's a very precious thing. And it's a very new and bold thing. I want to leap to one of the other amazingly wonderful contributors to your book, Mary Beard. Now, the May name might be familiar to some, Professor Dame Mary Beard, famous for, I'd forgotten this, for being told she was what? Too ugly for television. Thank you. Too ugly for television. She has purposely, I think, grown her grey hair to be even more too inappropriate for television. Uh, she is Professor of Classics at Oxford. She is incredibly smart. And her area is the ancient world. So, Julia Gillard, I love this section. What on earth can we learn about sexism and misogyny now from looking at the Greeks back in 720 BCE? <laughs> uh, I, think, I think we can uh, learn a lot and we can actually learn, just to, to keep the theme going, we can learn a bit about this evolution of women's perspectives and the ability to tell women's stories because Mary recounts uh, in this chapter, I mean, she's a classics professor at Oxford um, and you could hardly be in a more historic, uh, one may even say oldie worldy, but you could hardly be in a more historic setting than that, you know, and she basically recounts how she was being a classicist like everybody else had been a classicist. And then she finally got to the stage where she looked at these uh, stories from the ancient world and, you know, wow, actually, when you look at it, they're stories about rape and they're stories about the mistreatment of women. And Which had been called being ravished being, being, rather than raped, for instance. Exactly. Um, and why why don't we read it like that? Why don't we look look at it from the women's perspective rather than the woman being, um, you know, the sort of extra in a predominantly male story? And so she, I think, has shown that evolution. But in the chapter, uh, she takes us right back to the early imagery, um, you know, uh, of... Uh, Penelope uh, weaving at her loom uh, because she's waiting for her husband to return home. Uh, and the first time as a female character she's introduced into this epic tale, um, it is her young son telling her to shut up, that no one wants to hear from her, that no one wants to hear a woman's voice. And Mary takes us from that moment uh, through the history of misogyny. Your book also takes us through some very contemporary ideas and thoughts from young women, as you've mentioned. There's a whole chapter on misogyny and intersectionality, again, one I found very powerful, by Alaida mendez Borges. She tells a fairly extraordinary but not extraordinary story. She is a woman of colour. She was born in Cape Verde. She was in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, walking along the waterfront. A white male stranger said, do you want to go up to my hotel room? She thought of many things to say, <laughs> but she took the short path, she said, and said, I'm not Brazilian. 
To which he said, oh, I'm really sorry. I shouldn't have asked you. I thought you were Brazilian. Now, what is the import of that story? <laughs> Uh, she is a fantastic uh, young woman researcher at the Global Institute for Women's Leadership in uh, London. Uh, and, uh, you know, she's, she's lived around the world. Uh, she's uh, lived for a long time in Portugal. She speaks Portuguese uh, and she was doing research in Brazil, so obviously could speak the language. Uh, but she, she, in that reflection, was talking about intersection of class, race and sexism. So she has spoken very passionately about the stratification of uh, Brazil's society uh, with uh, black women uh, viewed um, as an underclass, often performing work as domestic servants, and therefore viewed as uh, people who uh, can can be uh, sexually exploited and should you know navigate they navigate the world, obviously having to put up uh, with all of this vile kind of conduct because uh, that is the way the intersection of class and race and sexism plays out in their lives. And the man in question, without presumably being able to articulate any of that in his mind, actually put her in a different class once he realised that she was not from Brazil and she was not part of the social class that he was imagining. So I think it's a very... Um, I mean, at one at one level, it's it's a just a revolting story about sexual, um, you know, a man being a sexual predator against a young woman who is walking by, but it's got these depths to it that Alaida is calling on us to look at because she wants us to think about the ways in which uh, all of these dynamics interact and how feminism has to be open to intersectionality that is bringing in, even as we analyse from a women's perspective, a feminist perspective, bringing in the pressures of racism and classism and other forms of prejudice particularly in colonial countries, a eh? like Australia. Jess Hill, that's a name maybe known to many of us here, Australian investigative journalist who wrote a book with such a powerful title, See What You Made Me Do. Mm. So she again contributes in this book. She's trying to work out why this hatred, this attacking this coercive control by so many men of women is so resilient. And she drops in that incredibly strong quote from Margaret Atwood. Margaret Atwood says, this is not scientific. I just asked a bunch of students, they were talking about poetry, but she said, I asked them, why women, students, why do you feel threatened by men? They're afraid of being killed. The other question, why do men feel threatened by women? They're afraid that women will laugh at them. <sighs> now, to start with, that seems almost a ridiculous juxtapositions of two things. But Jess Hill says, well, maybe not. Maybe that's what's underneath this rage. What do you make of that? Yeah, I... I really, uh, you know, uh, I was going to say enjoyed. It's not the right word. I really learned a lot from Jess's chapter and from her book. I wish I had all of the answers here. I don't. Uh, but, I mean, as Mary Beard points out in her essay, I mean, violence against women is unfortunately as old as history itself. Uh, but why it's still happening today uh, when we would say people are much more uh, likely to recognise the equality of men and women, uh, whilst life can be very, very hard for many people compared with the standards of uh, many eras and many generations that have gone before. We're more materially wealthy, more comfortable, healthier uh, than we've been at other times in human history. So why would there be this rage? And... I think it may be about uh, 
changing uh, societal roles, gender roles, um, a loss of a sense of control of uh, knowing, you know, a man knowing that uh, this is definitely his place in the world, this is the people who uh, must adhere to his needs, who are subservient to him, uh, that those things have been thrown up um, by changing societal norms and that there's a backlash and reaction to it which comes out in rage. Uh, I, I wonder a lot um, about how all of this plays into social media. I've asked myself the question many times without ever getting to a satisfactory answer, whether the vile misogyny you see on social media is just giving expression because of the anonymity of the platform to the misogyny that was always underneath in our society. So whilst we like to think we were moving forward, actually there was just this huge, you know, sewer of misogyny there and social media is the window that lets us see it. Or um, is social media actually exacerbating um, and without social media there wouldn't be that volume of misogyny? And I don't quite know the answer to that, but it's certainly there and for many women it's lived and experienced through uh, physical violence and or con con uh, coercive control and Jess looks at all of that and she's so knowledgeable and has been in contact with so many women uh, that the stories she tells are incredibly powerful. I think we need a laugh. We need a laugh, yeah. Kathy Lett is also one of the contributors to this book, who I think is a friend of yours. Yes. A writer, very funny woman. She's lived in the UK a lot of, time of her life. She got a call one day when you were PM from the BBC, a producer saying, Kathy, she's been doing it again, referencing you, um, your mate Julia. She's been outrageous. Can you comment? And Kathy says, well, I went through my mind a list of leaders who transgressed previously, Clinton, Berlusconi, Ceausescu. <laughs> and she thought, what could it be? What could Julia have done? What did you do? What had you done? I was photographed knitting. <laughs> that was it. Yeah, uh, uh, there's there's a wonderful uh, Obama uh, parallel here. Uh, about every 12 months, you might see on social media feed, remember when this was a scandal and it was when Obama, after all those years of wearing dark suits, walked out one day wearing a tan suit and broke the internet. Um, and uh, people going, r r th those were the days, weren't they, when a scandal was, you know, just the president of the US getting on a lighter suit. We have more serious scandals these days. But yes, uh, more serious scandals certainly have happened uh, than a Prime Minister knitting. You were just pandering to the women, she was called. It was Women's Weekly, was it? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Kathy nicely says, look, one of the things she does is collect jokes. So she quotes one of them, the dumb blonde joke. Why are dumb blonde jokes one-liners? And why are they so short? The answer is so men can understand them. <laughs> I've been a blonde all my life. I also used to collect dumb blonde jokes. Seriously, cracking jokes. It's you and Theresa May talked about this. You can't really joke in public, can you? Because if someone gets the wrong end of it, that's news too. Is joking a good way out of it for most of us in our lives? Or is that trivialising it, do you think? Oh no, I think I think humor can be illuminating. It can it's in its own way, it can be a bit of a weapon, it can get people to think. Um, so I mean in the House of Representatives, uh, you know, and even at uh, press conferences, I would crack jokes. And yes, there's always the risk that they're misconstrued or that you're seen as sending up something that's truly serious. But I think it's just one of the ways that human beings communicate and uh, try and illuminate what it is that we're trying to say. So I'm not worried about that. Kathy, of course, is a, a noted uh, writer and comedian and she um, uh, that's her stock in trade. She's wonderful with the puns, with the one-liners. And you know, as a result, I think she uh, does shine a light on all sorts of things, including sexism. Uh, she talks about uh, women being each other's wonder bras. You know that we uh, uh, that we're there to support and uplift other women. And I like that line. 
<laughs> You've also made a very big point of speaking to three young women at the end of your book. You kind of interview each other, really. Um, Chanel Contos, whose name again might be well known to you, who was researching sexual assaults on girls who were in high school, particularly assaults perpetrated by boys of high school age. And she was blown away by the response. It was enormous. What have you learned from her, do you think? Yeah, I've learned a lot from her, actually. Uh, uh, she uh, came uh, to the Global Institute for Women's Leadership in London because she was studying there and it was part of her studies that she decided to put out this survey about um, sexual assault in high schools and she put it out in Australia, just in two high schools to start with and the volume of stuff she got back, it ended up being stories in the tens of thousands that she uh, anonymised and then put on a website and then led into a campaign campaign around uh, teach us consent. And I think I, I've learned from her and indeed the other young women that I've spoken to for the book and more generally, I think that there's you know, a new style of activism amongst younger feminists. They're very uh, intolerant of the slow pace of change. Uh, they're very motivated to speed it all up. They're not that interested in being seen to be acceptable. They don't worry that um, people are going to look at them and say, um, you know, she's, she's a nice person or I really get her. They don't mind, um, you know, they're prepared to irritate, anger, inflame even uh, to make sure that change happens. And I think that that's quite a different personal style uh, from the one that, that uh, many of us have learned over decades. So yes, I can stand in the House of Representatives and give the misogyny speech, but all of us have uh, lived, I think, with this dynamic that, you know, if you you, you don't want to be the angry woman. You don't want to be the bitter woman. You don't want to be the one who's constantly told to lighten up. Why don't you just smile? Uh, we've all self-moulded for a bit of acceptability. And I think this next generation is not going to self-mould for that. They're just going to keep on pushing. Um, and we need that change. <laughs> Your last chapter is called Misogyny, What's Next? And I have to say, I giggled a bit when I saw that and I thought, oh, more misogyny. Yes. <laughs> but in fact, that's not your question. What is next? Well, I'm trying to invite uh, people through the book and through the work of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership to think very directly about what it is that they can do in their lives, in the things that are within their power to bring about change. And I invite particularly uh, women at the end of the book to think who you would be if you had grown up, had your working life, had your family life, had all of your life in a gender equal world. Um, if you'd never worried about those footsteps behind you late at night, if you'd never um, moulded yourself to be more agreeable, if you'd always believed that your contributions at work would simply be weighed on merit, uh, if you'd lived in a world where intertwining work and family life in productive ways was just the norm, you know, who would you be if that was the world that you'd encountered day after day since your youngest days? And I think we be quite different and I think we would be feeling lighter and more joyful about our existence and I think for both women and men we'd live in a better world because gender stereotypes don't just confine women they confine men as well and so I'm inviting people to imagine that future and then work backwards to what is it that I can do in my own life and it doesn't have to be um, 
standing on the bus giving various versions of the misogyny speech. Um, uh, in fact, I was, idea. well, I might specifically <laughs> counsel against that. I don't know how uh, th those on the journey might react, someone starting to yell and huff and puff on the bus. But, um, you know, in our, in our own lives, I think we've always got some things we can do, whether it's how we role model for uh, the children we're in contact with, uh, what we do at work to create a supportive environment for women, whether we back each other in or not, what we do in our community, what we do in the world of politics, uh, how we raise our voices when we see sexist conduct, how we react when the media reports things in a sexist way. Uh, we've all got some power in those regards and if we use it for change then we'll get there more quickly. Julia Gillard, just one more question to round it off. It's 10 years. To some, a very short 10 years. To some, a very long 10 years since that speech. If you were asked to pull out a few of the big changes that you've seen in that time, what might they be? Yeah, it seems uh, it seems a short 10 years uh, to me. Um, I, I mean, obviously, because we've been preparing for all of this for a, quite a long time, uh, the 10 years has been on my mind. But before we got to this stage, uh, I would uh, meet young women, you know, I'd be walking down the street, meet a young woman who would say something to me like, I was you know, 14 when I heard your misogyny speech and I'd be looking at them going, shouldn't, shouldn't you be at school? Why, <laughs> why, don't, why aren't you at school? And then you'd add it up and go, oh, because you're in your early 20s. That's why you're not at school. Um, so it's uh, been a short 10 years. Um, the big, uh, I think, big pieces along the way, um, certainly me too, I think uh, showed that social media, which can have so much toxic power, can actually be used for good, and that we got, um, you know, sexual harassment out from the darkness into the light, and people were prepared to call it out to talk about their own experiences. I think that's been incredibly important. Um, I would say. Uh, in, and they've happened in various ways around the world and in reaction to different events. Uh, but the women's marches um, in the US, here in Australia, in the UK, uh, women's resistance, we're seeing that in Iran now, um, women's resistance, we're seeing it in Afghanistan. I think the force of those activist movements has been uh, one of the big takeouts from the 10 years that's been, and I think will continue uh, to have force in the world. Uh, here domestically in Australia, I think so much of the uh, election was shaped around uh, women's policies, women's voices, and to see an election like that uh, is something I don't think the political pundits would have predicted even sort of 12 months ago. Uh, but I think it's changed our view of politics and changed it for the better. So they're some of the big moments. But you know, we call it waves of feminism for a reason because you get to do the big roll forward, but there's always the backwash uh, and the fact that we can see things like the chaos around reproductive choices in the US, uh, that we can see uh, regimes around the world that are um, using populist politics and uh, demonising feminism and women's equality as part of that populist politics. That's part of the backlash. So these things, you know, don't happen in one nice linear straight line ever forward. We make an advance, then we've got to deal with the backlash, we make another advance. But I'm an optimist that we're, we'll get there over time. We've just got to quicken the pace. Julia Gillard and the Pink Book, the fabulous, which wrong side? Gosh, I'm not good at this. I worked for the ABC for too long and we never got to advertise anything. <laughs> not now, not ever, in pink. Julia Gillard will be, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So Julia's book is for sale in the foyer. There are pre-signed copies. Um, there will also be a queue and you will be out there for some time <laughs> signing. I would like to just remind us to say this is the end of the book. Obviously, there will be carping critics and curmudgeons who want to stand in our way. 
but we don't have to listen to any lectures from them. Not now, not ever. <laughs> Julia Gillard, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.